This is the Free Heal Life Podcast, episode number 132. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Heal Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. What's up, everybody? I'm back for another edition of this fine podcast that we've been doing for quite some time now. And I wanted to kick it off with some good news. I'm starting to see some skiing happening in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, looks like Parisher in Australia just opened. Threadbow in Australia opens this weekend. Treble Cone in New Zealand on the 25th of June. And uh, Catedral Alta Patagonia, Argentina appears to be open as well. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out to those folks all around the Southern Hemisphere. It looks like the game is on. So I hope you're dropping some knees. If you are, send me a photo, podcast at freehealllife.com or some information. Give me a snow report. Get us some stoke, people. I want to hear how it's going. And uh, good to know that winter continues elsewhere. Meanwhile, I'm here in like 90 degree weather and uh, enjoying the summer. And uh, I hope you are as well wherever you may be. But if you're checking in, you're listening to the podcast, and you are one of the dedicated ones that wanted to keep up the free heal life throughout the summer, I'm here for you. And I appreciate you being here as well. Other newsroom and notes, batch number two of the free heal life protector skis drops today. Go to the website to check it out, freehealllife.com. And you can connect with our shop manager, Miles Schaefer, and uh, the rest of the crew, and they can give you some answers if you can't find them on the website, but there are plenty of resources on freehealllife.com, and you can go and find out more about the Protector 95, the Protector 105. Uh, There's videos there, as well as on our YouTube channel. Craig Dosty did a fine review of the Protector 95 on telemarkskier.com. You can go to that as well. And we're just going to keep on moving and moving and moving. So hopefully you'll check that out. My guest today is inspired by the philosophies and techniques of the 19th century Hudson River School of Artists. His artistic vision is one of revival. He works to restore the classical landscape movement with a modern insight on preservation ethics and reverence for wild spaces. His goal is not to create a perfect likeness of wild places, rather to communicate the unique feeling of time and place. More often than not, his creative process involves skiing, hiking, or biking, to plain art painting locations across the American West. Please welcome another fellow telemarketer to the podcast, Ian Blackall Scott. Ian, what's up, man? Welcome to the Free Hill Life podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm stoked, dude. I uh, This is uh, another one of those conversations where I'm going to be getting to know you as we go. So I'm, I'm excited. I always like meeting new people and, uh, you are, as far as I know, the, the first artiste that we've had on the podcast. So that's pretty cool. I like that. Well, so, yeah, arts, arts, my first love, but telemark is definitely up there. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. And that's, you know, we're going to get into that kind of how, how we met and stuff, but, um, I kind of, you know, I always like to kick it off you know, with kind of figuring out like where people are from. I always like to kind of understand that because, you know, mountain culture is kind of unique in and of itself. And uh, a lot of times when I'm talking to people, um, you know, there's there's a lot of stories, I guess, where people grow up in the mountains. And then there's a lot of people who maybe found it, you know, a little bit later in life. I was kind of curious, like, where, where did you grow up? Well, I'm from a small town, uh, just outside of Portland in the Columbia Gorge. It's called Corbett. It's not really a town. It's just kind of a beautiful place with like a post office and a school. But um, Does it have a stoplight? Yeah. No, 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 no stoplight. No stoplight. So, All right, cool. So that's legit small then, um, my friend. Just, uh, but, you know, I was close to the city, um, but still I, I lived in a beautiful place. You know, 
the the closest mountain was about 45 minutes away ski, ski bowl on mount hood um awesome place so i'd go there a lot um Timberline and meadows as well uh but ski bowl is always my favorite when they had snow so i yeah i, I grew up my parents got me into skiing as basically as soon as i could walk um and telmark came about four years ago that 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 was the next step. I took off my training wheels, but yeah, the ski history in my family goes way back to like, be like my great grandfather in like the 1920s in uh, California. And so he was skiing before there was lifts or anything. And then it passed on through the generations. So I'm just a product of that. I love that. Was it what what uh your grandfather was uh I mean if that's going that far back that's you know even pre World War 2 stuff. A lot oh, of Oh yeah. Well, no, is my my great great grandfather started skiing on my dad's side. Oh really? Wow, that yeah. that far back. Yeah. Wow, that's um, cool. Do you know well, do you I'm know sure any of the story my, on that or what's what's kind of no, the No, he just got into it outside of Los Angeles. I was talking to my dad last night and you know, there's, they just tour up in the hills. Um, but my grandfather on my dad's side, I never really knew him because he died when I was really young. But um, I mean, this guy lived for skiing. He uh, he was like an NCAA championship in Solemn um, back in the 30s. So my, my dad was definitely a young baby for old parents. But so I definitely get this obsession with skiing from – him i would say yeah that's interesting i wonder if he was part of that like early do you know uh was he part of that early sierra club i don't know if that's even be predating that i can't remember i we we've had some discussions on here about uh the sierra club in in and around los angeles and those mountains are there's some really cool stuff like mount baldy's there and there's kind of like a hut up there i believe that's a sierra club hut but I don't know if it's all the way back to the twenties. I can't even imagine. Cause I, you know, I've been around that area. I don't know if you've been down to LA in and around those mountains, but I can't. Yeah, I've been up there once. Have you? Okay. But, um, not super familiar with it. You know, I currently live here in Truckee, California. So, um, a lot more snow there and a lot more ski history here, um, for sure. But, um, I know they mostly skied, like back in the twenties and thirties up at Badger Pass. Oh, okay. Um, I have heard of that. Yep. So yeah, that's that was the first ski resort in California with a lift, as far as I know. But that's... yeah, so my roots go way back there, but also um on my on my mom's and dad's side, I'm like seventy five percent Norwegian, so I go way back. Oh wow! So you roots. so you really do have the you got you got the Norwegian roots. I like that, <laughs> and, and, and some Swiss too. So I got a little bit of that Alpine, but mostly that Norwegian telly. I actually, my mom knows a lot about her family history and her a lot of her um, Norwegian um, ancestors came from like the northern coast. When I was looking more into my dad's side, they actually came from the Telemark region. No, no in way, Norway. Yeah, Re- really. Do you know? Do you know what town by chance, or towns? I guess. I guess that's uh, kind of a broad. You know, yeah, all over. I mean, I, I couldn't be specific, but yeah, like right there in the middle of Norway. That's amazing! Wow, that's really cool, man. I love that. Well, that's cool. So you, you got uh, so you're, you you know you grew up a little outside of Portland, and and you've got uh you've got some ski roots. Sounds like the parents were skiing, so they're getting you getting you out right off the bat. Um, oh yeah well my dad he grew up here in uh tahoe where i'm at now and and that's that was his life growing up and definitely and then my mom she grew up in spokane i mean it's not a great ski hill there but she grew up doing it all the time so yeah you got 49 49 degrees north there schweitzer's close i mean that's it that's a ski zone too though for sure oh yeah 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 um that's that's cool that's pretty country up there too yeah, but I I still call my home Ski Bowl where I started. Um, but then I I spent a lot of time in um, uh, going to college Grand Targhee Resort. Spent a lot of time there. 
like 60 days a season usually. <laughs> oh, so, did, I, so you so you moved out and went to college down in Idaho? Yeah, in Rexburg. Oh, nice. So, yeah, I was trying to get up to I didn't like Rexburg too much, but I love Drig, so I try to get there 4 days a week and I was basically just there to ski. For sure. Yeah, Re- yeah, and, Rexburg's uh, got Oh man, I was I always for uh Kelly uh Kelly Canyon is that? Oh yeah, there's a, there's a little hill there. Yeah, yeah. yeah Kelly can shout out to Kelly Canyon. It's on it's on the list to do one of these days. <laughs> I've always yeah, skipped I mean, over I, it. I but. never actually skied there. I've snowboarded there a couple times, but I never brought the skis out. But um, yeah, Grand Targhee. I mean that that was where I spent so much time, and but I didn't really get into Telmark. That was when I came to Utah. And, uh, I, um, just love skiing was skiing all the time, mostly backcountry at that point. Um, cause I was poor. I was going to art school there and just trying to figure it out. But a buddy of mine, we were just backcountry skiing all the time and we were, uh, doing a terminal cancer there, um, in, uh, the Ruby mountains and there's a Creek you have to cross to get to the main line. And I, I threw my ski across this creek. It was a pretty wide creek at the time. And it was on those frame tour bindings. And the frame, the heel piece just broke off. Oh, no. And I was like... <laughs> and, you know, I, I'd always, like, seen... There's this guy when I was uh, going to school at BYUI. Um, there's this instructor. We had great instructors in the outdoor uh, kind of rec program there. Um, and he was this like this telly skiing legend and like his his license plate said telly his dog's name was telly like he was obsessed with it and like this guy was so cool and i was like man i want a telly but it, it, i was like oh, i'm not like cool enough for that but when, when that heel piece came off i like took it as a sign <laughs> that's like the best telemark story i've ever heard <laughs> yeah yeah it was no, like it, it was, was like an like, like an omen it really was, and I was able to lock the heel piece back in and do terminal cancer. I was like, that wasn't that hard. I thought that this would be like the ultimate line. I know there's much harder lines to do there, but I was like, oh, that was easy. I need to make this harder. So that that next week, I got back, and I came into Free Hill Life. And, uh, yeah, I got hooked up with a set of used skis and boots for pretty cheap, and and I'd just go up to Alta every day after work till the end of the season and just try to figure out what I was doing. That's so rad. How, when, what, so that was four years ago? Yeah, 2018. Okay. Wow, that's so crazy. I know. And that's what's so, that's what's kind of funny is like, you know, when we kind of reconnected, it was really connecting with you through the art thing. And I, I didn't, like I didn't really realize you had come to Free Hill Life and like that whole connection too. So it's been kind of cool to realize like, you know, you got gear from there and kind of got into telly and then I found you through the art thing. And um, yeah, that's that's rad, man. So were you, did you go to art school in Salt Lake then? After you no, were up I, at, I in went Idaho? to, it was called Bow Arts Academy. It was, at, it was, it was, it was in uh, kind of between Provo and Springville. Hmm. But I lived in Salt Lake, so I'd take the train every day. Wow. That's dedication, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to live in Utah County, but I, I like living in Salt Lake. That's where my wife worked, and she was going to the U, so it worked out for me. I don't know. It just worked out to live in Salt Lake, and then I was the commute person. So That's awesome. So is it like a small little kind of academy-type art school or – yeah, they're called ateliers. Um, it all really kind of, it was like an emergence in the 1990s to bring back the old classical way of of art education, you know, as opposed to, it's it, it follows more of a apprenticeship type model of like the Renaissance hmm. and how you learn. It's, it's not like you go to a university and they, for the most part, will just say, create art and that really give you any instruction on how to be an artist, how to work as an artist. Um, they just want you to be creative and they really work on teaching you creativity, but not so much technique and 
the business side of art and all that of just basically being in a mentorship program is what I was doing there. That's amazing. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense. Cause it's like, I feel like, yeah, you need to, I mean, that's just like, as you, I didn't even know that existed, but that as you're saying it, that makes a lot of sense, you know, because it's, it's a, uh, in some ways almost like a trade, you know, like where it's like, there's a tradition, exactly. there's a trade that's being passed down and, someone who's more experienced than you, like you said, like a mentor, somebody that, you know, can give you applicable advice, but also technical advice too. Like, um, especially like, you know, if you're an oil painter or a watercolor guy or a sculptor, you know, I mean, there's all these different art forms and I mean, who better to learn it from than somebody who's walked that path and can yeah. inspire you. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Tell me a little bit more about that. That's, that's, I've never... when I was, I was looking for a school, um, I stumbled into this website called art renewal center and it was this movement that started in the nineties about bringing back the classical arts, um, kind of a reemergence of that. And so their main schools were in like New York or Sweden or Florence was the main one where it really started. But I was like, I, I can't afford to go over there. And then saw there are some other schools in the East coast. They're kind of like smaller Achilles. Like it's basically you are in an artist studio. You're part of that. And I was like, and I found that there was some on the list in Utah. And I was like, well, Utah's not too far away. And, at least I can ski. I mean, skiing has always kind of taken a priority over my education, much to the detriment of my education <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but it's like, I got to ski, you know, that, that comes first. And then I'll worry about education later. But that's how I went up to the, the Bow Arts Academy in, uh, in Provo. And it was, it was a good time. I mean, I learned a lot there. I mean, I didn't finish necessarily. It's not like you you get a degree or anything. Um, but y you kind of go through the program and eventually you become, uh, like an instructor at that, um, school. It was kind of the end of it. And I, I was definitely more of a landscape painter in my heart and what I wanted to accomplish. I wanted to bring out, you know, like those old paintings of like the, the Sierras and Yosemite that you see like that, like at the, like in, Washington DC of the yes in the 1800s that they painted yeah for sure just like the big the big mountainscapes and stuff like that um, yeah I I saw those um when I went on a trip to Washington DC when I was like 17 I was like wow I want to paint like that because before then I was painting a lot like Picasso or I don't know I was really into like jazz music and cubist like very abstract kind of stuff hmm. Um, but this can like seeing those paintings by Thomas Moran, um, Albert Bierstadt, seeing those guys that went out West, like back when it was just unknown and they, they painted the scenery and blew people's minds away with how great it was. Turns out the reality wasn't as good as the painting, but I want to, I guess, paint like that. Cause you know, a lot of people do today. Like yeah, I guess that's an interesting, I never even thought about that, but are, would you say there's not as many people doing landscape these days? I mean, I guess, is it, cause it, you know, kind of going back to your schooling, what's really striking to me is sort of like this idea of, you know, uh, passing something on, you know, I mean, were you, uh, are, do you have a lot of contemporaries out there that are also doing landscape now? Or is it, do you feel like you're kind of kind of rolling solo in that, you know, in a lot oh, no, of regards. I, definitely have a, I have a community of landscape painters, um, mostly in Utah, which actually had a really great art community, not a great place for art sales, but great artists live there. Um, but their, their kind of approach landscape with more, was more impressionistic. That's kind of what came after, like in the late 1800s, it kind of was the start of modern art. So they, their, their approach to landscape, is very different than what I want to accomplish. So there's a lot of people painting landscapes, but more in an impressionistic style. You know, I want to bring back a more old world style. It's 
more you're not painting what you see you're painting more of a a better version of what you see in classicism philosophy it's called the higher truth so it's yeah you might be seeing these beautiful mountains but there's a spirit to those mountains that you can enhance in your art that has a more emotional effect of what those mountains look like instead of what they look like in reality. If that makes any sense at all. That's rad. I it totally makes sense. Um, yeah, that's, that's neat, man. <laughs> I've never thought of a painting like that, but that's, uh, that's, that's a really interesting way to look at it. Um, I mean, maybe that's, maybe, you know, like maybe that's why art moves people. Like you said, there's almost, you're almost bringing, you're almost like infusing this, this like extra piece of soul into it or something, you know, almost like a layer you can't see, you can feel, you know? Um, exactly. Yeah. That's cool. I love that, man. Wow. I, that That's cool. I, I like the path you took. I, you know, the other thing that kind of sticks out is you're like, well, I didn't gr- really graduate. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. Cause we all, we you know, you just think about that, you know, like the way we educate is sort of like this idea that you, you just get to the end of something, you get the diploma and you move on. Um, no, I'm just a ski bum dropout. Yeah. But, but that's, but it, it's so, you know, it's interesting because, you know, as you're, as you're talking, I'm thinking of all the parallels to telemark, obviously in my brain. And I'm like, man, that's very similar. You know, I, you know, kind of like you're, you're drawn to this classic, cl- you know, classic, uh, classicism. I don't know. Classic version of, landscape you know like i think you know i think that's where a lot of the history of telemark sort of plays in with me too and i i always think um you know how important that is and yes you can modernize things and and whatnot but i think there's sort of this underlying soul that kind of goes with telemark that's why i always you know i'm always talking exactly about protectors exactly, of the turn yeah. and you know and i also like the mentor concept too like as you were talking about that with art i'm like man you know like that's a big part of telemark too is like I'm always trying to encourage people to share share the turn with other people that are interested in it and maybe can see you know see the feel it and they go wow I really want to try that but how important it is for us to that are interested you know that love telemark too is to pass it on to the next generation or friends or I mean maybe not even generation but just people people we know that are interested and, uh, cause it is, it's kind of a art, you know? Oh, it definitely is. That's when I, I just always thought it looked cool, but also I was attracted to the, the gear because it was so simple and affordable. I mean, NTN aside, but the, the classic 75 millimeter style, it just is so beautiful, I guess. And the way the turn was, is so beautiful and everything about it was kind of appeal to that classical side of me uh, um what i what i like in this world so it just it just went along great with what i believed in i guess <laughs> no that's that's rad i totally get it man yeah i mean it you know it's it's like when you say stuff it makes sense you know i i i get it <laughs> yeah i mean i'm not a great person with words that's why i i express more with my brush but yeah, I, I can't describe just the feeling of telemark. I, I think no one really can, um, and how it relates to kind of everything in my life, art and spirituality and family history. All all these things we've been talking about. It's it's just such a amazing thing. I found out about it and started doing it. Feels like I've been doing it forever. I love that. Uh, yeah, it's only been four years, and it's been great. You, you you sound like an old soul telemarker, so that's all good, even if you've only been doing it four years. <laughs> I like that. I, I'm curious, you know, with, with going back to the art thing and kind of the parallel with that, is there, with you sort of being drawn to like a classical art style, are there, you do a lot of oil paint, right? Is that, yeah. that's your primary or at least what I've seen, I guess. Um, are there some techniques that you've learned through being mentored 
that are maybe considered old techniques that maybe art like modern artists don't either know or use as much anymore like that you sort of love because you somebody passed it on to you and showed you well start off in art school it's all drawing i we did painting but i didn't actually learn how to paint there it was all drawing so it's all proportion technique um a lot of um i guess plaster casts of old greek statues a lot of live models um that that was the focus of just the traditional technique you got to get the technique down before you can go express yourself i guess that that's a big parallel with telemark you have to get the technique locked down before there's a lot of room for creativity within the turn and it's fun to watch people and their variants of how they do it Um, but yeah you really have to just lock in that technique early on so it gives you, you understand how it works and it gives you room to express yourself. When you don't have the full range of tools, you need to start out skiing. Um, it really limits what you can express either through art or through skiing if you don't have that technique figured out in the beginning. Yeah, that's that's really true, man. I mean... What an interesting parallel, you know, too, because it, you really can't, yeah, you just, you have to, you owe, like, you got to go back to the basics, you know, like the basics are the foundation. What's funny too, and you probably know this as an artist, I think about this as a telemark skier all the time because I've been doing it so long, you know, I'm almost to the 30 year mark and which is bananas, but I think about it because there's things I probably do and 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 I think when I watch really good telly skiers too that expression is I always say I can literally tell any if you put every telemark skier that I know personally in in the same clothing for instance and they're like 100 yards away I could probably tell you who each person is by their by their expression the, you know, of, of how they're doing, like you said, how they're doing the turn. But I think what maybe throws people off is the little bit of foundational technique that it takes for each person to do that. So like you said, so they can create on top of it. And, uh, I think you mentioned you like jazz too. Um, you know, it's like music, right? Like, you know, for oh, like, yeah, like, for sure. like free form jazz, like people are probably like, you know, man, these guys are just all over the place, but right. Like there's this foundation. There's like, you know, playing in the same key or I I mean, again, there's so many parallels there. Like you can't really, maybe you could just wing it, but I think there's a, a real finesse to something where you almost can't see the, the foundation in somebody's art or expression, uh, when they're, innovating on top of it like that's what makes those the great innovators is they're usually masters of the fundamentals you know so yeah like i love to use picasso i mean i still love picasso um even though his his style is different than what i want to accomplish now but you know his his understanding of of basic artistic technique is was on like if, if you look at his early paintings, they are amazing. They, they, they just look like everyone else's at the time of what a, what a great classical painting looks like. And he was able to break that because he'd already mastered it at such a young age. Yeah. Um, so, we, But even throughout his career, he'd go back to painting classical paintings despite, you know, his wacky stuff. Oh, that's interesting. I see. And I, I would probably, I, what is, what's the really famous one? Like Garnica or something like that or? Thinking, yeah is that the name of it am i saying that right i don't even it's been a while since i took an art class <laughs> so uh but yeah you yeah, know it's like pretty good um but i th- yeah i think about those pieces and i'm like oh yeah like when you think picasso you think that you don't think like that maybe the other stuff if you're not as well versed in his body of work so oh man that's well that's rad um 
I, I love that you, you kind of feel that parallel. I like hearing you talk about it, like the art versus the telemark stuff too. That's really neat. And Well, telemark, it's not verse. Telemark is art. I guess the way I look at it. Beautiful. I, mean, the- I, 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 am, I am definitely, a, I have not locked down those, those tech. Well, I could hold it, hold an edge good enough, but everything I know, I basically have learned from uh, Alan and Mike's really cool telemark ski book you know that's oh that's that's interesting i've never had a like an actual like lesson i mean i i always see old guys on the hill and i follow them and become friends with them and kind of learn a little bit but you know that's mostly where i got my i guess education the telemark was just from that book yeah for for anybody who does isn't familiar with that book it's really one of the classics and illustrated in a way that kind of gives you these fun visuals of how to telemark ski. And it's still, yeah. I mean, again, there's, it's, there's so many fundamentals in there. Like it still rings true today, even though it's probably on like the third or fourth or fifth edition at this point. Yeah, I have, I think I have like the third edition, but yeah, they're always updating it with newer, I guess it doesn't have really the difference on how an NTN turn would make, but definitely with modern, stuff it definitely but but yeah there's a lot of kind of leather boot stuff in here still yeah have, have you have you since you've only been doing it for four years have you have you gotten a more classic setup like that just to try oh yeah it? yeah i mean I, I i do that just as much as i um do on my i got a pair of volets with some switchbacks those are kind of my good for everything ski um but then i i have a old karu 10th mountain division ski with a three pin on there oh you hit the, I, you hit the ebay didn't you that that one uh, no actually the trucky uh dump oh really <laughs> yeah i mean I, I find lots of good stuff there i mean i i i was originally going to pick up a bunch of skis because I, I i've been doing paintings on skis more abstract uh paintings on actual skis and these were in great condition they they're like, man, they just need an edge tune and they're good to go. So, like, you're painting while you're skiing? Oh no! <laughs> well, actually, yeah, I do that. Not while I'm moving. I usually stop and paint oh, cool. uh, what I'm seeing. But um, no, th- these are. I have a new kind of collection of skis that I've primed and have painted on. Like oh. the skis are the canvas. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! I saw those. Those are incredible. Those are super cool, man. But yeah, I, I love getting out on the leathers. The problem is I can't find a good sturdy pair of leather boots. I mean, I have a newer pair. They're, they're like a Garmont um, boot that was maybe discontinued three years ago. So they're pretty new, but they're they're definitely more Nordic oriented. They don't have the support. So finding like an old leather boot i mean it'd be nice if someone still made those i I think there's maybe somewhere still that makes them but yeah we need we need to find you some solo extremes those are the that's the boot you want because it's basically low cuff lace up but reinforced throughout the entire boot so it's like you get the lateral stiffness, but it doesn't have like a plastic cuff. So it's like a, yeah, it's like a good classic sort of Nordic telemark. You know, it's like, it's, it's like skiing in the eighties, you know, mid eighties. Yeah. I mean, I, I love doing that. I didn't find any of the shop last time I was in there, but I'll probably come out. You just, you keep time next keep, year. And- yeah. Keep on me, man. If I know, if I know your, sh- your size, I can keep an eye out for you. Sweet. Thanks. I know. Yeah. But you know those leather boots. It's still, it it's it's a fun experience, and I wish. That's another thing. Like I can ski more modern equipment and have fun, or ski that old equipment and have just as much fun. And, um, but it, it really helps me. Riding the leathers and the the old skis really helps me become a better skier. And it's, this year I've improved a lot just spending more time on those. Yeah. And that's why I was kind of asking you about like 
art art techniques because I was as we were kind of talking about the old classic of Telemark, you know, it, obviously I think gear, but there's a lot of techniques that kind of aren't necessary on modern equipment and oh yeah, yeah and like that's the oh, go ahead go ahead kind of making the wedge you know when you turn like if i mean i i have a pair of metal edge cross country skis i'll take at the resort and people look at me funny i'll dress up in like old norwegian sweaters and do that whole thing but um like even you kind of have to pick up your back foot in your turn and you kind of have to create your own um side cut by kind of angling your skis you know yep i know exactly that, 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 that's a very lost thing i mean it's not necessary with modern equipment but it's one of those old techniques that you don't have to do anymore yeah no it, you, you're explaining exactly like one of them i was thinking about especially like if you're trying to maneuver through stuff or you know there's almost like a almost like a step in front of of a step in front of yourself i guess almost at an angle like you're saying you're almost making a wedge um, and then sort of kind of that lift up on your inside foot and sort of bring the skis together because they're straight and narrow and they don't really, they don't carve. <laughs> so yeah, but I, you know, it's, it is, it's really fun to get on that equipment because it just makes you have to look at everything totally different speed, uh, just agility, angulation, you know, that's always the funny part when you, you know, at least for me, I'll put a, a pair of skinnies on it and I, I try not to mix them up in the same day because it's so mentally messes me up. Like if I go from like a modern setup to like a skinny setup, you know, next thing I know I'm, you know, sitting on my ass on the, on the ground because yeah. I tried to angulate too far and there's like literally no ski, <laughs> there's no ski there to keep me up, you know? So it's kind of funny. Well, yeah, I, I watch your videos and you're, you're such a, you're such a master at it. You're like a Kung Fu master on those. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. Well, I hope I, you know, I, it, you, you brought up a good point cause I've often thought, I hope at some point leather boots, somebody makes leather boots, the ones that we're sort of discussing, because I think it's important for that to live on somewhere. You know, are, are you going to make like thousands of boots? I don't know, you know, but I, I would love to see that as part of some of, you know, it's kind of like us at the shop. You, I mean, people that watch us and I've tried to instill that in all the younger folks that work there, like, Hey, have this in your quiver. It doesn't mean you need to ski it every day, but it's like, it's like that one tool, you know, that, you, you, you know, you got to pull it out at least once a year just to sort of yeah for sure get spanked, you know, and just go, Oh, okay. I, this is, this is different. And it's hard. And, uh, I hope, I hope that lives on cause the gear isn't going to live on forever. You know, Hey, I'll just, I'll start, I start making my own if I have to. Um, <laughs> but I also, I, this was my first year trying NTN. I mean that, that was a game changer too. I haven't purchased the gear. I just demoed it. I mean, I'm just an artist, man. So <laughs> one of these days I'll get it. Um, but the, uh, the feeling is different and it's, it's just a different feeling. It's, it's rewarding. It's super fun, but it's just different. And that's, there's just so many options in telemark. Another thing I love about it as I've discovered it more and more and dive deeper, deeper into this. It's almost kind of like a cult. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's probably know, a fair assessment, but it's, it just gets better and better. Um, I love that, man. Well, so after art school in Utah, is this when you moved out to Tahoe? Yeah, I, I took a short, we're just looking to get somewhere new. We moved to Washington uh, in Leavenworth area. So we just did that for a couple months, just figuring it out. So I was working at Stevens Pass. That's the resort yeah. up there. there. There's there's a couple Telmark skiers there. They're pretty dang good. Stevens has some old history, man. There's there's yeah. a, the Sven and Glenn Classic, which we I don't know if I've talked about on here, but that's an yeah. There there was an old contingent up there long long time ago. And then uh, had a short time there, 
and it was kind of going back to the northwest and it was like where's that sun i kind of missed the sun and uh so we came back to tahoe we're not really back i mean um to tahoe i guess my my, my dad's side of the family's from here so it was an easy place to move to um and we're able to get a place just right up at a North star resort. So that's where I go most of the time. Um, and it's actually got a telemark center and not a lot of people know about this. It ha- you can actually rent telemark gear at, North, at star? North star. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. That's rad. Yeah. I mean, it, it gets the reputation as more of like a family resort or like a parks, um, rider resort. Um, but yeah, there, there is a Nordic center. It's never used. <laughs> Uh, and there's a full lineup of uh, NTN and cable. Uh, I think they got some Targas on there that you can rent. And there's clinics um, and everything. Yeah. I'll so have to, I'll it, have to check in it. I'm glad you told me about that. Yeah, I, I need to get you. I mean, it's really it's not used, but it's just the passion of the guy Aaron who runs the Newark Center there. He's he's just kept it going. Even if no one uses it, I I hope more people will because you can go to North Star and learn to telly. That's it's not a very it's not a lot of this um, terrain is not very steep because it's on an old volcano, so it's pretty forgiving for learning and all the equipment's there. So that's so cool. I haven't I haven't been to North Star. Um, I, is it? I'm trying to think. Is it? Um, Around the lake, I'm like trying to think. <laughs> my my it's, my mind is like, okay, here's the Homewood. Here's... Hills between uh, the north side of Tahoe and Truckee. It's like right in between the two. Oh, it's right there. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because there's there's definitely like a lot of resorts for anybody who's never been to Lake Tahoe. I mean, there's first off, it's are you from the North Shore or the South Shore? <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, you know, and and then there's like a variety of places you could go and. Uh, awesome awesome spot so all right north star yeah, man. i've I, only who, been to about half the resorts here so there's a lot yeah i think that honestly i think the funniest one i've been to there is grand labakan you familiar yeah that's actually the oldest ski resort in tahoe is it was originally just a uh, rope tow yep. put in in the 1920s yep we went there for i don't even remember why and uh we, <laughs> we a couple of us stayed at grand labakan stay skied on that little that little hill there so that was pretty fun um but i so the tahoe thing this is this is kind of where i come across you and and your art and i'm pretty sure if i remember right i'm flipping through instagram the spread telemark hashtag and there's this piece of art that pops up from you that's a painting of snowshoe thompson and tell me if i'm getting this right hopefully i'm getting this right because this is how i remember it but maybe i'm old and senile as it as it were but oh you're good you're uh, right yeah so i see this and i message you and i'm like can can we buy this for the shop and and uh i had i didn't even know you knew what free your life was i think i just like messaged you and you're like oh really you know and so I ended up buying this piece of art from you and that's kind of how we connected a couple years ago. And, um, but what caught me was, um, and I didn't even know you were from Tahoe. I think I was just looking at it like, Oh, this guy's making a telly turn and it's a painting, you know, and every once in a while I'll see stuff like that. But I mean, your stuff is, it, it is, it's very classic, you know? Um, but I'm kind of, you know, tying in the, the Tahoe thing. Like I, I'm curious if that was, uh, if you, if you had done ski paintings or paintings of skiers and landscapes, like how did you kind of start do putting the skiers in there? And, and, and I, I was hoping maybe, maybe you could give the listeners a little background on Snowshoe Thompson. Cause I think a lot of people don't know who that is. Oh yeah. Well, I was, I just, um, sometimes I'm just looking for to provide a little bit, communicate a little bit more than just a pretty place um so snowshoe thompson i i've done a bunch of paintings of him he's kind of the tall tale legend the the godfather of skiing here in the sierras um so in the 1850s 
this is back when um, they had small kind of mining and logging communities around the lake and they needed to deliver mail and medicine to those people in the winter time. And there wasn't any way to, way to get around. And this, um, this Norwegian immigrant snowshoe Thompson, as he's called, um, volunteered to, I think it was like a, like 80 mile trip from one side of the Sears to the other, delivering mail to all these places. And he, he would, there's all these kind of legends about him and how, I mean, he had these, I mean, I've seen his skis, they're like 10 feet long and to like 10 pounds, 20 pounds each, like they're huge. Um, but this guy would just sail down the mountains just, and not necessarily making the telemark turn. Cause if you kind of track the history with Sondre Norheim and the 1860s, when that really became a thing and the 1850s in America, he probably wouldn't have been making that free hill turn. But he probably could have. So that's kind of just my creative license in some of those pictures. I always just like to, because sh- they are essentially free hill skis. Um, but it was said he would just go straight down, like super fast on these long skis, and he would get enough speed to go up the next hill. And he would just drop off packages along the way. That's so, yeah, and that's crazy. And I mean, that, that makes sense. I had never, I'm, I appreciate you kind of bringing up the timeline. Cause I guess I hadn't even thought about that predating some of the stuff in Norway and the idea, those skis are crazy too. I've seen replicas of them. Um, I mean, yeah, they're enormous and, and they operate more like a snowshoe, like a traveling, you know, a traveling ski, so to speak. Yeah. So. Well, people saw him doing it and he taught, these uh, people at these logging camps, how to make them. And to this day, they hold, um, they're called longboard races um, up in Gregel, about an hour north of here. And they they race on these old skis. You dress up in your 1800s where it's kind of a, like a weird mountain man cosplay thing. I, I love it. My wife, I took her there and she's like, this is weird, but <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's like a mountain man cosplay thing. And you race on these, these long boards going straight down the mountain. Have you raced on them? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely do it next year. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's cool. I think, I think my buddy Ty Dayberry, he's a South Lake guy, but I'm pretty sure I saw them. I don't know if it was at that particular one, but, um, I've seen, yeah, I've seen people racing going down the hill. Yeah, you, <laughs> I don't know if you're, tur- I, like you said, I don't oh, know if you're turning a place whole lot. <laughs> where they do it. Oh, really? It's the world, it's the world championship, as they. <laughs> yeah, the it's only place the they do it. Longboard races. Oh, that's amazing. The yeah. oldest ski race in America. Wow, that's pretty cool. I love that, man. Well, and 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 so obviously your artwork has kind of some of your artwork, I guess, has started to kind of cross over with, like you said, the newest stuff I've seen is almost like the tips of skis um, where you're using that as the canvas, you know? And and so do you have a whole collection of that going on now? Is that kind of something you've already completed or it's co- sort of like continuing work in progress? I don't know. That, that's kind of a different, that's kind of going back to that old jazzy style I was telling you about. Um, Cause I just think it looks better on a pair of skis you know, something more graphic. Um, but you know, I've been doing that just cause I don't know. Skiing is just so inspiring to me and it is a big part of what I love. And it obviously is just naturally reflected in my art and what I want to create. And also I live in Tahoe, so anything ski related sells really well. So <laughs> not a bad place. You brought that up living in Utah, like, uh, some good good place to be an artist but maybe not sell the art per se all the time so ta- it sounds like tahoe's got a, a good contingent of ski art buyers then that come through there well yeah well we're in california so it it brings i mean i, I say this i'm not quite a tahoe local but you know we complain about the bay people but you know the bay people We'll, we'll spend they bring ridiculous money. amounts of money on things. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a that's often a thing that uh, a, a ski town locals forget is that 
generally speaking, for many of us to enjoy the uh, fruits of the snow, winter, and skiing, it requires people with exorbitant exorbitant yeah, amounts and, of money <laughs> spending and they money. Love art. They definitely. <laughs> there's a lot of great art collectors I've met here. So that's su- that's um, super cool, man. Are you doing? So yeah. do, are you are you in gallery? I guess that's something that I should ask you too. Is like, do you have art art pieces in galleries, or do you do shows, or what? What if people? I do are, both. You do? Yeah, okay. I, I have kind of my main shop. It's in downtown Truckee. It's called a uh, Mountain Art Collective. Um, but then I, I do a lot of shows. This year, I'm pretty booked up with shows. I got one starting tomorrow, and like I'm doing like seven over the summer. It's yeah. Wow. But, you know, I, I was, you know, working part time at the ski hill, you know, bumping chairs and you can only do that so long. But so, yeah, I, I, I do art full time now. Congratulations. That is that's an incredible feat, my friend, to be able to do that. So uh, and to do anything like that is is it's not easy. <laughs> no, but it's, you know, if you just wanted to make things easy, you know, just take up all pine skiing right <laughs> i always say, i always try to tell people that like tell them the I, I remember when i was a kid when i first started telemark skiing I, you know i'm 14 and there was one season where i did half alpine half telly and i remember just thinking to myself i'm like i am never going to get like is this is never going to work unless i just wholly jump in a lot like a telemark turn you know like you can't sort of, uh, I, I always try to tell people like you ever see people coming from Alpine and they sort of like put the heel up, but they sort of don't get the whole extension of the legs. And it's like the danger zone of the whole thing. And I think telemarks like that in all aspects of it is like, you really just got to dive in and do it. Otherwise you're just going to sit in the danger zone forever and then it's going to suck and you're never, it's never going to click. And, uh, yeah, I'm a hundred percent committed. I think. Yeah, last year I threw away my, or no, I repurposed. I painted on them. You know, <laughs> I don't throw anything away. But I, uh, yeah, got rid of, put out of commission my Alpine for for good. So I, um, I think I'm stuck. I'm stuck in the telly life. I love that you're living. The, you're living the real free hill life now. I like it. That's uh, well, I love it too. I love that man. Well, so, um, okay, so you got some art shows coming up, um. You're you're painting full time. I mean, how many how many hours a week? I mean, as a I, that's one thing I wanted to ask you as a full time artist. I mean, what does that look like in a week? You know, because I think like just time wise, I mean, are you painting every single day? Yeah, yeah. I, it's I wake up and uh, I mean, I'll usually either wake up and ski or wait, depending if there's fresh snow, and then go home and paint and try to paint a lot outside you know a lot of times i'll be skiing and painting i'll carry all my paint stuff in my pack with me and i'll be painting in plein air as they call it you know painting just out there um and then i'll come home and work on some larger pictures in my studio um and i i'm not the best at stick keeping attention going so but sometimes i'll end up working to like midnight and then do it again the next day wow but not saying i'm painting that whole time uh, I spent a lot of that time just goofing off or skiing but it's kind of just it's not like a job i mean it, it is a job but it's it just kind of sometimes I, i've been making the mistake of making it all encompassing like it's it's what i do all the time it's like if i'm not painting what am i doing right now <laughs> Yeah, well, and I'm I'm sure that having the ability to do it full time just increases the creativity in some regards, or you know, allows you to get better at it. I mean, I think that's the 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 yeah, it's immersive like I have factor. Unlimited freedom and no freedom at the same time. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, no, I I always say you can't avoid the work. Unfortunately, so, somewhere along the line, you gotta you have to incorporated even into the things you love the most, you know? Um, but I, I'm a, 
some people don't think that you should make your passion your job, but I, I've always been kind of the opposite. I've always thought, you know, you only got one shot at this life. You know, you might as well do something you like, you know? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, everything's kind of work, but I love, I love working. So I love, I count skiing as work. I mean, that's a write off right there, you know, for sure. I, I'm up there painting, you know, I'm getting inspired. I'm creating stuff on the ski hill. Um, yeah, it's, it's all, there's no real line. Everything's just all blurred together. It's just and uh, telemark's been a huge part of that. I love that, man. Well, as, as people, I'm sure there's going to be people interested in finding out more about your artwork and, and want to see it because we've been talking about it. Where, uh, where are the places online that people can check out your artwork or, you know, get in touch with you? Yeah. If you just, um, Ian Blackhall Scott, um, that's my full name. If you just search that on Instagram, on the internet, either go to my website or my page. Um, that's, or just Ian Blackhall Scott at gmail.com. I mean, everything's just, if you look up my name, you'll find me. I love that. Yeah. Cause I, I guarantee people are gonna want to reach out and, and, or if nothing else, just look at some of your pieces and, uh, and I'll make sure to put in the show notes, like how people can find you to make it a little easier. Thanks. Yeah, no, totally. No, I'm, I'm super pumped for, for this audience to sort of just hear and then be able to sort of go, um, see what you're up to. Cause it's, it's really great work and what a cool story, man. I love it. You're it, it's fun talking telemark and sort of weaving in and out of the art thing too. That's very interesting to me. And, uh, it's cool to hear your perspective and kind of your thoughts on it. Um, uh, you know, as an artist and then sort of m- making claim that telemark is art. I, I, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll always, it really agree, is. Always At agree least to me. You. Yeah, it is to me too. I'm sure it is to a lot of people. Um, you know, and, and just that expression of, of, making that turn i mean that's what's so cool about it is like it it's always different it's different for everybody but like you know like we were talking about there's there's the underlying fundamentals there but there's a lot of room for personal expression throughout the whole thing too yeah man well cool well hey i really really appreciate you coming on what a i had a fantastic time talking to you man and 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 uh getting to know a little bit more about what you're up to so thanks for coming on i really appreciate it well thanks so much for having me it was great absolutely I mean, any opportunity to talk about tele skiing especially is just I and mean, i could talk about it all day so i know we need to we need to find a way to like come follow you on one of these uh uh outings where you're taking your skis uh you're taking your painting uh stuff with you and painting as you go i think that would make a a killer little short edit um just to see what how that works that's pretty cool yeah that'd be that'd be awesome i mean i mean i don't have the i I try to make those myself but you know you can only do so much with an iphone yeah no i hear you i know you gotta have you gotta have someone trailing you or something but well cool man well have uh good luck with all of your shows and uh i'm sure we'll check in again sometime in the future and uh everybody go check out um ian's stuff online in the meantime so All right, brother. Well, we'll catch you next time. Thanks again. Uh, Thanks, Josh. So rad having Ian on and another fine person I've gotten to know and feel very grateful for, uh, for all these great people I've come across through Telemark skiing. And, you know, I, I love these conversations because it's, you know, not only lets us connect on telemark and things like that, but I always like hearing more about what people do in their lives. And especially this particular one was so cool because he's an artist and connecting on the art and the art of telemark and the history and just somebody getting into it. Not even that long ago. Uh, it's just, it's a beautiful thing. And I love these stories. I hope you do as well. Uh, It really helps me shed light on more personalities and characters out there that are passionate about the turn like I am. 
and I've always been fascinated by what people are doing in, in their lives as well. So I hope you dug that one. Please check out uh, Ian's stuff uh, via some of the links in the podcast notes. His work is absolutely incredible, and it's just it's it's amazing, and I can't uh, express that enough. So I hope you'll check it out. And uh, I'll be back next week with another another podcast on Monday. So share it with all your friends. And uh, if you want to stay in touch with us, sign up for the mailing list. Link is also in the show notes. And that's a great way to stay up to date on the Free Hill Life world, as it were. Like I always say, you can connect with me directly at podcast at freehilllife.com. Connect with the shop, customer service at freehilllife.com. And all the variety of things that we do at freehilllife.com or telemarksgear.com. So many URLs and emails. <laughs> Uh, I had a great time though, and uh, I hope you did as well. Let me know what you think about this one. Uh, you can uh, rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or just shoot me an email. But until next week, friends, family, protectors of the turn, I'll see you next Monday. And until then, spread telemark always. Peace out.